Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Pathology Learning. I am Dr. Monica. So today's class will be on cellular adaptation which is the continuation of part 1 and this is the second topic under the cellular injury topic. So now we had already discussed hypertrophy and hyperplasia in the previous video. So we will move on to the third cellular adaptation which is atrophy. So what is cellular atrophy? It simply means opposite of the hypertrophy and hyperplasia that is decrease in the cell size and or number. So we know hypertrophy was increase in the cell size and hyperplasia was increase in the cell number. It is just the opposite of the two. So it atrophy is decrease in the cell size and or the decrease in the cell number. How does this happen? For a cell to decrease in size, what we saw in hypertrophy, for a cell to increase in size, it was increase in the protein synthesis. So it will, should be the opposite, opposite of it, so that the cell size will decrease here. So either the protein synthesis must go, uh, uh, go down or the uh, proteins which we have produced must be degraded. So the protein degradation, it happens by a pathway called as ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So how, this results in the decrease in the cell size. So how does the uh, cell number get decrease in size, uh, decrease in number? Only when the cells die, the number of the cells will decrease, right? So this occurs by the form of uh, cell death called as apoptosis. Apoptosis results in the decrease in the cell number in atrophy. So the uh, uh, common examples of physiological uh, causes of uh, atrophy will be the same examples as that of the apoptosis. So coming to the examples, now we see physiological uh, physiological causes of atrophy wherein we see. Suppose a uh, notochord is present during the development of the notochord in the embryonal life and post birth the thyroglossal duct will also get involuted. So both these conditions, the uh, it has to revert back to its normal cyst. This happens by the process of atrophy. Okay, And the same thing happens in a post-gravid uterus, post-pregnancy, post-delivery. What happens is the uterus has to re, uh, come back to its original size. The uterus has to involute and this again happens by the process of atrophy. So these are the physiological examples of atrophy. Coming to the pathological uh, examples of atrophy. So anything which is not being put into use will undergo atrophy. Suppose a patient is having a fracture and the fra fracture what will happen the patient will not be moving. So immobilization. So if the patient is not moving about his calf muscles will undergo disuse atrophy. The same thing will happen. So, uh, muscle, uh, its nerve supply, its blood supply or its nutrient supply, whenever it is being cut off or being compromised, the muscle cannot function to its normal level and then again it will undergo atrophy. So, that is what is called as denervation, ischemic atrophy and malnutrition atrophy. So, pressure atrophy, we have an example of a leomyoma. When you have a large leomyoma, so what is a leomyoma first of all? Leomyoma is a benign smooth muscle tumor of the uh, smooth muscle tumor and it is most commonly seen in the uterus and it is called as a fibroid in the uterus this we all know right so whenever there is a large leomyoma what will happen it will tend to compress it is growing slowly it's inside the benign tumor it will be growing slowly so when it grows slowly it will tend to compress the host tissue around it with time this compressed host tissue will undergo atrophy and that is called as the pressure atrophy and the most important example under atrophy is this endometrial atrophy which is Again, as I discussed, is a precursor of endometrial carcinoma type 2. Endometrial carcinoma type 2. Endometrial carcinoma type 2 occurs in post-menopausal age group and it has the worst prognosis. So, if you remember the, uh, in the previous video I had mentioned endometrial hyperplasia led to endometrial carcinoma type 1. It occurred in premenopausal and perimenopausal age group while endometrial atrophy can also lead to endometrial carcinoma but this time it is type 2 carcinoma and this has the worst prognosis. So moving on to the next cellular adaptation which is metaplasia. So, what is metaplasia? It is nothing but one differentiated cell type one differentiated cell type is being replaced by another differentiated cell type. One differentiated tissue will be replaced by another differentiated tissue. Each word is important. So what happens in metaplasia? It is not that the 
adult tissue is directly from one type of adult tissue it is directly converted in converted into another type of tissue just by that just like that okay uh, it actually happens by the reprogramming of the stem cells the stem cells which is the reserve in that particular organ it will undergo metaplasia it will undergo ch certain changes so that the parent tissue which was supposed to be present in that organ is converted into some other parent tissue okay so that is because metaplasia is because of the reprogramming of the stem cells and this has been asked as an mcq also the most common uh, metaplasia is the squamous metaplasia remember it is the squamous metaplasia which is the most common it happens in smokers suppose this is the ciliated columnar epithelium of the bronchi and the patient is a chronic smoker so what happens the smoke is continuously irritating this ciliated epithelium ciliated epithelium is not a, a strong epithelium so it is a very fragile epithelium and it cannot take this insult chronically so what happens is it will undergo metaplasia into a squamous epithelium which is a much more harder epithelium squamous epithelium is seen in the skin so it is one of the toughest epitheliums so the uh, squamous epithelium can in turn ma manage this chronic irritation so it comes with a cost though when the cilia of the normal bronchi is being lost when it's lost the infections can occur because it is not able to clear out the infections so infections are more common when the squamous metaplasia occurs and it doesn't stop with that whenever there is an excess of anything it will lead to trouble okay so this squamous metaplasia which has happened if it acquires certain mutations it can have an increased risk of cancer it will convert into squamous cell carcinoma okay so again we have an increased risk of cancer over here coming to the next example which is intercellular metaplasia and we all know it by the another name called as barrett's esophagus so what is it this is the esophagus and this is the stomach if the patient is having the lower esophageal sphincter if it is lax what will happen the gastric acid hcl which is being produced is getting refluxed continuously in gerd so there is gastric acid reflux continuously going on to this lower esophageal end a normal epithelium of the esophagus was the squamous epithelium but this squamous epithelium cannot tolerate the acidic environment which is being created by the hcl so what happens is that to counteract this the uh, squamous epithelium of the lower end of the esophagus undergoes something called as the intestinal metaplasia which produces goblet cells so goblet cells in in intestinal metaplasia we have goblet cells which in turn can produce acidic mucin and this acidic mucin can in turn counteract this hcl okay this acidic mucin as such it will protect the lower one third of the esophagus from the acidic uh, irritation caused by the hcl Le let's see with the uh, picture so this is the endoscopic view of a barrett's esophagus so this is the lower one third of the esophagus wherein you can see this white area right this is the normal white area which is the squamous epithelium the squamous, squamous epithelium will appear white in color because of the presence of keratin but here in between can you appreciate this pink or salmon colored things which are projecting like tongues so these salmon colored tongues of epithelium is the intestinal metaplasia which is happening actually and that is called as the barrett's esophagus to call it as a barrett's esophagus endoscopically we have to see these salmon colored tongues projecting into the proximal lower in one third of the esophagus for at least more than or in or equal to 1 cm so more than or equal to 1 cm proximal to the lower gastroesophageal junction that is the gastroesophageal junction so that is when we term it as barrett's esophagus endoscopically so let's see the histological picture of the same this is the squamous epithelium which is the normal lower one third epithelium present in the uh, esophagus while this is getting replaced by these intestinal metaplasia so uh, can you appreciate these yellow arrowheads these represents the goblet cells these empty looking spaces are the goblet cells so goblet cells which contain this acidic mucin it is go it is going to be the hallmark of barrett's esophagus so remember it is very important hallmark of barrett's esophagus is the presence of goblet cells so what is this third image this is the special stain called as alcyon blue alcyon blue will stain acidic mucin at a ph of 2.5 ph of 2.5 
pH of 2.5 acidic mucin will get stained and this acidic mucin will appear blue in color under alcyon blue. Coming to the third example which is myositis ossificans. Metaplasia can happen not only in epithelium, it can also happen in the connective tissue. So one such example of connective tissue metaplasia is this myositis ossificans. So what is myo means? Myo means muscle while ossificans means ossification which happens in the bone. So bone is replacing the muscle. It happens post trauma. So post trauma inside the muscle bone starts developing and replacing the muscle that is termed as myositis ossificans. So what all we saw in metaplasia first we saw squamous metaplasia which is the most common metaplasia example was chronic smokers and and it can lead to increased risk of carcinoma also and secondly we saw about intestinal metaplasia and again that is called as Barrett's esophagus it will lead to an increased risk of adenocarcinoma because it is the intestinal metaplasia which is happening right so it can have an increased risk of adenocarcinoma now thirdly we saw about myositis ossificans so coming to the summary we have dealt with all the cellular uh, adaptations in the uh, both the part uh, part 1 and part 2 of the videos so what all we saw what are cellular adaptations these are reversible changes which occur in response to a pathological or a physiological stimuli so that the cell can adapt and survive in its new environment and remember this is reversible that is the most important keyword over here and we have four types of cellular adaptations which were hypertrophy hyperplasia atrophy and metaplasia then we saw about the mechanism of each and the examples of each under hyperplasia the most important example was endometrial hyperplasia which can lead to endometrial carcinoma type 1 while atrophy we uh, had a most important example of endometrial atrophy which is again an important risk factor for endometrial carcinoma type 2 and metaplasia we dealt with squamous metaplasia which had an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma and Barrett's esophagus which was intestinal metaplasia the hallmark of which was the goblet cells and these goblet cells were stained positive for alcyon blue at a pH of 2.5. So hyperplasia, atrophy and metaplasia all three were associated with the increased risk of carcinoma. Right. So that's it for today's class. Thank you for uh, listening. If you like my content consider subscribing and sharing it to your friends who can also benefit from the video. So meet you in the next class which is on cell injury and necrosis. Thank you.